Please be seated. Come on. Good morning, church. My name is Riley Pickrell. For anyone in here that does not know me, and I want to wish everyone a good morning and uh, a happy holiday season. I hope everyone's been enjoying their weekend, enjoying the fall weather. It's been beautiful the past couple days. Like, it's been absolutely prime. Uh, and I'm hoping everyone's also enjoying the spooky things um, as their holiday, their Halloween weekend is coming to a close. And, uh, but this morning we'll be continuing in Luke. If you'd like to be getting your Bibles out and flipping over to Luke chapter 5. And one of my favorite parts also about the holiday season as you're flipping there is I love the memes that go around. And especially uh, in Halloween when you have the, the little spirit Halloween costume pack memes. I don't know if you guys have seen that. There's one, one of my personal favorites now is the, the Spirit Halloween evangelist or pastor or preacher costume, which includes dad jokes and a overestimated sense of humor. So I do very much enjoy that and relate. But, uh, <laughs> but, oh, but there's many things about the season I do love. Um, but one thing is also the candy. I love sweet things. Um, if you know me at all, if you're my roommate, JC, uh, you know that sometimes I eat an, an maybe an unrighteous amount of, of sugar. Um, and <laughs> a, a few years ago, uh, this caught up with me in some ways. Uh, but what happened was basically, uh, when the church was first being planted, I want to share a quick story before I dive into Luke. Uh, I was driving back from my home in Ohio and back to my new home here in Lehigh. It was the first year of being here. It was after the holiday season, but it's still basically the holidays, so I was indulging. I was still eating. And uh, what my mom did was she baked me a tray of these things called peanut butter bars. And they're, they're kind of like peanut butter brownies mixed with uh, chocolate chips in a peanut butter glaze. And they are bliss. They are amazing. And there's one night I was driving in. I, I drove eight hours from Ohio. I finally get back to my home and here in Bethlehem. And, you know, I get back to my house and I have this nine by 13 full of these delicious treats. And so I reach in, and, you know, I've earned it. I'm hungry. It's been a long day and I eat one and it was amazing. So then I sit down and, you know, I wasn't quite tired yet. You know, after like a long trip, like you're exhausted, but like you'll still sit down and watch TV when you get home. And so I sat down, I put a TV show on and I reached down and, and grabbed another one of the peanut butter bars. It was amazing. And a few episodes go by and I thought, you know, a third. It's holidays. I've earned this. You know, it's, it's, it's still almost Christmas, even though it's a week after Christmas. Um, and so I have a third one. And then a few episodes go by, I reach down for a fourth, and I notice, whoa, this is the last brownie. Um, I've already eaten four, five, six, and seven, and I was reaching in for my eighth one, and, and I thought, what the heck? I just ate it. Um, and in one sitting, I ate this whole tray of these delicious brownies. My mom made enough for me and my roommates, and unfortunately, they did not get to have any. Um, but I sat down, and, and I fell asleep, and 30 minutes later, I woke up like I had just drank a big gulp of coffee. I was wired, and I was having the biggest sugar rush of my life. My, my insides were like, felt like there were knots. I wanted to throw up, but I couldn't, and, and I was just wide awake. And moral of the story, some things are just meant to be shared. You should share them. Um, keeping things to oneself, it could be a waste. Um, in my case, it was very unhealthy. And also, it deprives others of something really, really great. Uh, but the title of today's lesson is The Gospel is Family-Sized. It is something that is meant to be shared. That the gospel by nature is something meant to be given to other people. It's never meant to be kept. That the good news is that the forgiveness of sins, the coming before God with a completely clear conscience, but also a part of it is having life to the full. That the gospel is, is getting the forgiveness of sins, but also living a full life. Being able to overcome sin in this gospel, it must be shared. It is not something to be kept. And if you guys want to be turning over, uh, we're going to be in verse 27 in Luke 5. And I'll start reading verse, 20, uh, in verse 27. And it says, After this, 
Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at a tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And we'll stop there. And I love how Jesus phrases that at the end. I've not come to call the righteous, but, but sinners. Uh, those in the world who, who do not yet know him or do not know God. Jesus came for those that don't have. He came for the ones that are in need, for the lost. And any person today who is an imitator of Christ, who claims to be following him, we must take on this same charge that our life is about living and knowing the lost and bringing and sharing what we have now obtained. I remember back, and many of you know, I'm from Ohio. I went to the University of Cincinnati, and I still remember when I was a college student, and I was, in the first time in my life, I was examining what I really believed about God, what I believed about the Bible. And I remember sitting at a Panera Bread with a guy named Mike. Uh, the guy who led our, our campus ministry at the time, and I remember studying the Bible with them, and a few weeks in, we started looking at authentic discipleship, like what does this mean to actually follow Jesus like, to, to the full, uh, to imitate him? And he looked over across the table as I'm eating some mac and cheese, and he says, Riley, you do understand, if you do this, the rest of your life is going to be about people, right? And I remember really thinking about that. I was like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. Well, if I'm actually following Jesus, my life has to be about the lost. I have to be concerned. And me and my introverted self hearing this was like, oh, I'm good. Like, that sounds horrible. But if I was going to be someone serious about the gospel and serious about what Jesus is here for, my life is about the lost. I must be about it. Mike also explained very clearly, clearly to me, and I think it's worth mentioning that mission and purpose are, are different things. Like, we all have purpose, and our purpose is to know God. It's to be in a, a loving relationship that it's only growing deeper. Uh, he satisfies the deepest needs of our soul. That's our purpose. But mission is almost equally important because without purpose, mission is meaningless. It's an arbitrary thing. What, what are we going out and telling people if there's no purpose? But without mission, the drive to, to bring everyone we know to Jesus, then no one will ever actually know their actual purpose, that they both must be there. And, and I knew Mike was right, sitting there at the table, finishing up my mac and cheese. I knew that I, if I was going to be truly one who's concerned about the things God's concerned about, I must care for the lost. That my life must be about bringing people, sharing what I have, and bringing it before them, just like he was doing with me. Because the truth is, in the world, people run after relationships, status, career, money, escapisms, drugs, pornography, whatever it may be, all these things to meet their deepest need, which is actually God. And part of being a follower of Christ is that we get to show them a better way. That the world before knowing him is sick. That it needs something. It needs a medication. A part of our life as Christians is we bring that to people. Being a follower of Christ means you're willing to go wherever whenever, and talk to whoever to get the information out there by any means necessary. Now, uh, I have a picture, actually, it's going to be behind me of a place uh, called Chernobyl. It's a power plant that opened up in the 1980s. And many people probably know of it as, as something that's kind of infamous um, because in April 1986, uh, this nuclear power plant that was located in the USSR uh, had a nuke or a meltdown, um, which is not good. Uh, what this, you know, in recent years, historians were becoming more and more aware what led to arguably the largest ecological disaster like in human history. And it, honestly, it could have been so much worse. It's crazy. Um, but it, what happened was that due to faulty design of the nuclear reactors and then also uh, poor safety protocols, um, actually, the accident happened during a safety test, ironically. Um, but anyway, um, between 50 and 100 million curries of radio 
nuke glides, um, which are not a good thing. You don't want to be around these things. Were shot into the atmosphere. Uh, millions of acres of forest and farmland, they became, became contaminated. While only, only a handful of people actually died in the explosion, thousands in the years to come were affected by the radioactive material um, and developed all sorts of diseases and long-term effects. Uh, the ramifications of this event was crazy. And actually today, it's, it's still going on. That only a few years ago, they had to build basically a, a large building on tracks and wheel it into the actual site. Uh, they called it the mega tomb for Chernobyl because the, the original barricades that they built around it over time uh, just become dilapidated. Um, so they had to hurry up and figure out a way to kind of contain it. And that was just a few years ago. Um, and they estimate that the total time it will take to actually get the area decontaminated will be ending around the year 2065. At the impact of this event from 1986 is going to stretch all the way, you know, another 30 years from now. Um, and the crazy thing is that all of this that happened, it didn't happen on accident, and there wasn't an attack. Uh, but over a period of months before the meltdown, before April 1986, uh, there began to become problems in the radioactive or in the, the, uh, the reactors. Um, but what happened was that those that were in charge told the, the technicians, you know, don't tell anyone. Proceed business as usual. Don't bring the information up. That the, the information that could have stopped this was being withheld from the people that actually could have done something about it. Um, this was all due because the USSR was a propaganda machine. Um, it had an image to promote to the world, and they didn't want to have weakness. And so information was withheld from the people that needed to hear it. Speculatively, one person could have stood up, said something, and this all could have been avoided. Um, but the crazy thing is, it's withholding information that the damage that this has in our temporal world is huge. But to be honest, if you compare this to the span of eternity, you know, from 1986 to 2065 is just a blink of an eye. How much more damaging is it to withhold the gospel from somebody who needs to hear it? Information withheld is a powerful, powerful thing. If we are willing, or if we are to be people, or no, we must, I'm sorry, be people who are willing never to withhold this information, that if we follow Jesus, our life is about getting this news to people that need it. And we're actually going to go back a story. If you guys want to be going to Luke 5, 17, we're going to look at the passage right before this dinner that we just read. And and in this passage, we get kind of a, a great illustration that embodies what this means. Someone who's willing to go anywhere to get the news to people. Uh, and it's the story of the paralytic and his friends. And it says in verse 17, One day, Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. And they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal and sick, uh, heal the sick. Some of the men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. But they could not find a way to do so because of the crowd. They went up on a roof. They lowered him in on a mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Then Jesus saw their faith and said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said that we have seen remarkable things today. I love this story. I, I love this group of guys. These group of guys are just willing to do whatever it takes to get their friend in front of Jesus. And, and I like to imagine this scenario, like picture uh, all the, the, these religious authorities, a very intimidating crowd of people all gathered in on one home where Jesus is teaching then enter this group of friends. <laughs> They're carrying their, other, their buddy who's paralyzed, and they get there, they see this group, uh, probably pretty imposing and intimidating, and the house is full. And so I, I can imagine, like, I kind of wonder if there was like one crazy one that was like, guys, let's go around back. Let's see if we can get on the roof. And then everybody just followed him. And, and then they get there, and, and like, imagine this scene. Like, 
they got to get on the roof. And then they had to get their paralyzed friend on the roof. And then they have to find a place in it to start digging up this guy's property and, and tearing a, a fully grown man-sized hole into this roof. It's kind of a, a ridiculous scene. <laughs> and then they have to hoist their friend up, drop him down. Also, these, these guys would be the worst trick-or-treaters. You would not want them at your house. You destroy your property and then put a disabled guy in your living room. Like, this is what they did. And, but, this, but these guys were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend in front of Jesus. I love imagining these conversations. You're just like, guys, we just, if we just get him in front of JC, boom, like he can do it. We just got to get him there. These guys did whatever it took. You know, what does it mean to be all about the lost? Uh, that your whole life is being around sinners and outcasts and spiritually disabled and just carrying them to the feet of Jesus. Just getting them there. Jesus can do it. Like, he's got every ability to, to break any chain of sin, to, to release anybody. We just got to get people there. You know, what does this look like today? It's, I think it's sending that third reminder to make sure a friend gets to church, um, texting him again. Or, or maybe a coworker at, at work is, you know, you've asked them before, um, ah, they're not interested. Asking them again. Um, keep bringing it up before them, not giving up. Setting up time to go out and share your faith with somebody uh, to set up a, a Bible study because you know that the harvest is plentiful. Like that's a promise in scripture. There are people walking this earth right now just waiting for someone to ask, when will you be that kind of person willing to stop at nothing, to climb, to tear, to lower your friend through the roof, to get them to Jesus? How far are you willing to go? You know, why is getting everyone you know, in front of Jesus so important? Uh, the forgiveness of sins, yes. The, the be able to, uh, to be before God guiltless, that's something that's offered in the gospel. That we, we get to have that. We own that. Uh, if you're baptized, if you've repented, your sins are forgiven. But also, I, I love in, in verse 24, uh, the second part of, of the, how amazing the gospel is, is, is also this. Um, he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what you've been lying on, and went home. Because and stopping there, the gospel is not merely just the removal of the guilt. It's the ability now to overcome everything that once mastered us. Like, think about that. Everything that we've carried around with us, that, or that's carried us. Um, impurity, chronic sins, laziness, lust, hate for people, hate for yourself. All of this, these things that carried us, that acted as a vent or a comfort, we now master. That we can pick it up. That there is, there is, there's nothing that Jesus is not able to give us the power to overcome. Do you believe that? Like, honestly, that's a, a promise in Scripture. Do you believe that? The gospel must be shared, and it's for people that need it, that are looking for exactly this. Now, switching you know, thoughts a little bit here on this passage, I think this is also a lot to learn from the Pharisees and these stories. Because the Pharisees... These guys were all about themselves. They were all about being with each other. They, set, they created boundaries between them and the sinners. Um, it's funny, in the story, it said Jesus was eating uh, dinner with some others and tax collectors. When the Pharisees came, they said the tax collectors and the sinners. Like, these guys drew lines. And I think it's easy for us today, especially those who've been in the kingdom, who've known these things, to, to kind of keep to, to the crowd that keeps us comfortable to not break outside that. And, and, you know, and we're, not the, you know, we're not people at, you know, in the grocery store, you bump into somebody. It's like, get back from me, sinner. Spray Purell everywhere. Like, nobody does that. But I think sometimes, you know, the kingdom is just so good, it's easy to stay in it. Yeah. It's easy just to be around people that, that are saved, to be amongst them, um, because the kingdom's amazing. Now, I think about this this past weekend, the Young Professionals Campus and teens got together, and all we did was eat hot sauce that was really hot and cry together and, and just did wacky, crazy things and played card games. Earlier, later uh, in the weekend, that morning after, we all went on a hike and made rock puns and just walked around. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was a, subscribe to Geologic on Instagram now. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is life to the full. I mean, I remember in college, we'd go out, and if alcohol wasn't going to be a part of it, it's like, what are we doing? It's like, oh, is it actually going to be fun if there's not something to dull our senses? 
we get so much in the kingdom. It's so easy to stay there. And, uh, and this is what we see in the Pharisees. They keep to themselves. They're unwilling to get in there, but they draw lines. Do you spend more time with the church in, the fam- in your family and, and people that make you comfortable than with the lost? Uh, are you bringing people to Jesus? I have a few questions. I, I was even thinking through myself. When was the last time uh, you gave it away, that you took the gospel and gave it or withheld it? Think about that. When was the last time you actually invited somebody to church or brought a friend? Are you sharing it? Are are you putting it out there for people? When was the last time that you intentionally went somewhere for no other reason than to share your faith? Just to look people who are looking for people that were looking for this. Do you go after it in the same way that these friends go after giving their friend to Jesus? You know, I also think one thing that really does sadden me about Christianity today is is that in many ways, many people live an inoculated form of Christianity. That what it actually is, is they get little bits of Jesus. You know, they go to church on Sunday. You know, they have a Bible study group and during the week sometimes. They pray every now and then. Uh, they listen to the Christian music in the car, whatever it is. Little shots of Jesus, but never actually full-blown. Now, this was me for many years. Now, I grew up going to church. I, I was a religious kid. I, I knew who Jesus was. I read the Bible and all these things. But the, the desire to save a world that was dying, that there are sick people, never there. I, I never really thought it was my responsibility. I thought it was somebody else's. But that's a, this is a non-negotiable thing in discipleship. You are about the lost. And sometimes I feel like uh, with our friends, you know, they, they give off a, an asymptomatic kind of symptom. You know, I, that's how I think I was even before I studied the Bible. I appeared to be well on the outside until somebody asked me the questions that I needed to be asked. How far are you willing to go with your religious friends? Are you willing to get in there with them? When's the last time you examined the Bible with a friend and sat down and helped them look at the basics? What is discipleship? What is repentance and baptism? Sat down at a Panera Bread with some mac and cheese. I remember that. That was me. When was the last time you did that with somebody and went off and did that? The complete freedom and life, it's, it fully awaits them. It fully awaits all these people. Are you willing to do what it takes to get them to Jesus? Uh, closing, guys, this week, if you're not actively studying the Bible with somebody, think about that. And this week, do whatever it takes to change it. Think about your week. What can you do? Who can you talk to? How can, by the end of this week, you actively engage in this call to give it away, to be about the lost? Where this week is God calling you? And what might get in the way or cause you to maybe stop short at the door? You know, you see the crowd, you're like, oh, line's too long, (laughs) and leave. I feel like I do that everywhere. If a line's too, I have a horrible, I'm I'm not a patient person. Um, But anyway, what's getting in the way? for you to dig the hole, to drop in your friend and get them in front of Jesus. Let's ask each other these questions and talk about it. That's all I have this morning, guys. I hope you have an amazing Sunday uh, and a great rest of your weekend.